Hey guys, this is Warhawk Beyond 2040 bringing to you another edition of the Spider-Man review series and today I am going to be talking about another favourite episode of mine from season one and this episode is also another two-parter so what I am going to do is just like I did last time when I talked about the Spider Slayer and Return of the Spider Slayers which was also a two-parter for this episode I am going to be talking about both parts one and two in its entirety from start to finish and this two-parter introduced us to a villain who would play not only a big role in this two-parter episode in particular but he would also play a big role in several other story arcs in several seasons across this show and this villain I am talking about is the one and only the Hobgoblin and it's very interesting to know that the Hobgoblin was actually introduced into the show before the Green Goblin and all due respect to the Hobgoblin who is a great villain in his own right for me the Green Goblin is one of the greatest Spider-Man villains of all time and he's definitely up there with your Venoms, the Kingpins and your Doctor Octopuses and nobody has given Spider-Man more grief than the Green Goblin so when I first saw this episode it puzzled me a bit to know that why would they introduce the Hobgoblin first? Why don't they just introduce the Green Goblin instead? Because anybody who follows the comic books will know that the Green Goblin came first in the 60s and the Hobgoblin wasn't introduced to about another 20 something years later on. So I think everything worked out okay in the end, I guess. So you know, you save the best till last, but Hobgoblin actually played a very big role in several story arcs in the show's run, and I never realised until I saw the end of the credits, when the Hobgoblin would speak and laugh, I remember watching this episode at the time thinking to myself, I know that voice, that voice sounds very familiar, and then when he started laughing I just thought, wait a minute, that sounds a lot like the Joker, but who is it? So when I saw the credits, I saw it was Mark Hamill, who I know as the Joker. And I just thought, oh my gosh, it's only Mark Hamill doing the voice of the Hobgoblin. And, you know, he did an excellent job doing the voice of the Hobgoblin. But for me, Mark Hamill will always and forever be the Joker. And I think everybody would agree with me on that. So the Hobgoblin was first introduced in Amazing Spider-Man issue 238 in 1983. And the Hobgoblin would go on to be one of Spider-Man's biggest thorns in his side. And he's inspired by his predecessor, the Green Goblin. And he uses a lot of similar weapons and equipment, such as exploding pumpkin bombs and a flying glider. And a little trivia for people out there who may not be familiar with this, or may not know this, the Hobgoblin was actually originally Jack O'Lantern, but because he kept coming up short in his battles with Spider-Man, he ditched the Jack O'Lantern persona and then created the Hobgoblin persona and has stuck with him ever since. So that's a little trivia out there for people who may not know that. And Norman Osborn would play a very big role in this two-part episode. And this is the first time that we have actually seen him since the whole Spider Slayers story arc, where we saw Norman Osborn play a big part in the creation of the Black Widow Spider. And we also learned that he was secretly working for the Kingpin. Now, in this two-part episode, we learn that Norman Osborn wants to screw over the Kingpin, and we also learn that he was a big part in creating the Hobgoblin and making him who he is. There is a line that he says that, when I first met you, you were just a random punk off the streets, and I made you who you are. And the Hobgoblin retaliates by saying, yes, you may have made me who I am, but let's not forget one more important thing. I know your secret and I know who you really are. So there's kind of a little foreshadowing in the Hobgoblin's words, but you know when it comes to Norman Osborn and the Hobgoblin, you know it's just a matter of time before one of them screws over the other because, let's face it, both of them have massive egos. But I would probably say... Norman Osborn probably has a bigger ego because he's all about control and he knows that the Kingpin wants control of Oscorp, as we learned in the Spider Slayers episodes. So everybody in this episode has their agenda, but if you look back, all fingers point to one single source, 
Norman Osborn. Kingpin may be in charge and in control of everything, but it's really Norman Osborn who's the guy who wants to get one over on the biggest crime boss in New York City. So that made for some very good and interesting storytelling. And as we all know that Norman Osborn would go on to become a huge villain in his own right when he would transform into the Green Goblin in season three. But that's going to be covered and saved for a future edition of this review series. But it's quite interesting to see Norman Osborn before he actually becomes the Green Goblin. So in a way, I wouldn't necessarily say he's completely evil. He just has his own agenda and he likes to do things his own way. And another character who played a big role in this two-part episode is Norman Osborn's son, Harry. Now, unlike Norman Osborn, his father, Harry Osborn is a good person at heart and he constantly yearns for his dad's approval and attention. And that gets played out more in this two-part episode. And we would also see his friendship with Peter Parker grow more and they would become more like brothers as they would end up becoming roommates. And this relationship would be a very important one for the show because as we all know, Harry Osborn would also go on to become the second Green Goblin, which happened in season four of the show. And that's also going to get covered on this review series as well. So there's lots of things that happened in this two-part episode that laid the groundwork for what was to come. And in my opinion, Norman Osborn and his son, Harry Osborn, are two very interesting characters. One's not evil, but would go into madness. And the other one, I wouldn't necessarily say he's fully evil. He just likes to be in control and do things his own way. So in a way, Norman and Harry would end up going different paths, but one not by choice, but the other by choice. So they're like polar opposites in a way. And I think that's what makes these two characters very interesting, in my opinion. So now we're going to start by talking about part one of this episode, and this is simply called The Hob Goblin. So this episode starts off with a shot of a warehouse where we see a mysterious man is putting on a costume and dons a frightening mask over his face. And when he turns around, we see it's none other than the Hobgoblin himself. And what I liked about this two-part episode in particular is they didn't give too much away about the Hobgoblin's backstory. And as I mentioned already, the most that we learned about him is he was just a random thief who Norman Osborn met and gave him all this equipment and helped make him into the Hobgoblin. So we don't really know his real name. We don't really see his real face. The most that we ever see of the Hobgoblin without his mask is a shot of the back of his head at the beginning of the episode. So I liked what they did here. And we wouldn't actually learn about the Hobgoblin's true identity until season three. So I like that less is more so when we do learn about the hobgoblin's backstory in season three it's all worth it and i think it was very well done in this episode and as i mentioned already when we do learn about the hobgoblin and his real name and his true identity it does come as a very big surprise because you don't really see it coming at all and not to give too much away but it's someone you wouldn't really expect but that's not going to be covered in this edition. That's going to be saved for a future review for another time. So we see the Hobgoblin take off to New York City on his glider. And at that very moment, we see a limousine driving with the Kingpin talking to Alistair Smythe on a two-way radio. Smythe very smugly says, I don't understand. Why do you have to attend all these public events? And the Kingpin explains that it's very important for me to keep up appearances, Smythe. Nobody must know Wilson Fisk is really the kingpin. Just then, we see the mysterious man flies over Fisk's limo. And at that very moment, at Empire State University, Harry Osborne asks Peter Parker to be his roommate at his new apartment. Peter replies that they barely know each other and wonders why he doesn't ask his friend Flash Thompson. Harry replies by saying that Flash is a good friend, but his father won't pay his rent unless he finds a roommate that is responsible, and we all know Flash is not. 
However, Peter is worried that he won't be able to afford the rent, but Harry tells Peter that his father will take care of everything. As Peter and Harry arrive at the dig sites for the Fisk School of Criminology on the ESU campus, we see Peter Parker meets J. Joan of Jameson and Joseph Robinson and Wilson Fisk and Norman Osborn on the stage. As Norman introduces Wilson Fisk to the crowd, Fisk comes forward and breaks the ground off the construction site with a shovel. However, Peter's spider sense goes off, and as Peter rushes up to Fisk, he pushes him out of the way, and the man on the glider, who is none other than the Hobgoblin, fires a laser from his gun, which misses them. Peter then runs into an alley and changes into his Spider-Man costume. See, it's quite interesting that Peter Parker would actually save Wilson Fisk, because at this point in Season 1, Peter Parker doesn't know the existence of the Kingpin. He only knows Wilson Fisk. And, of course, the Kingpin has been very much aware of Spider-Man's existence for quite some time. So it's interesting to see that these two would interact with one another, not knowing of who the other really is. So I think, in a way, that kind of sets the tone, because at first, Peter saves Wilson Fisk and thinks to himself, oh, I just saved someone's life. But then later on in the show, he'll find out that, wait a minute, I actually saved the Kingpin. What the hell? So... Nice little setup here for what's to come in the near future, and they did a really good job here, in my opinion. As we see the masked man is firing into the crowd, Spider Man web swings out and attempts to kick the man off his glider, and then asks him, Just who the hell are you? And then the masked man introduces himself as the Hobgoblin and fires his laser gun, and it hits Spider Man's web line and breaks it. However, Spider-Man is able to fire another web line before he can hit the ground. Kingpin then enters his limo and before driving off, demands to know who the man on the glider is. As Spider-Man lunges at Hobgoblin, he moves out of the way and Spider-Man misses him. Spider-Man then fires a web line but Hobgoblin is able to cut it with the wing of his glider. However, Spider-Man is able to swing up and grab the glider. To get rid of Spider-Man, Hobgoblin flies higher into the sky towards a jetliner. Before Hobgoblin can make Spider-Man crash into the jetliner, Spider-Man lets go and falls down. As Spider-Man falls into the city, he tries to use his web shooters to stop himself from falling. However, Spider-Man discovers that he's out of web fluid and as Spider-Man continues to fall, he grabs a cloth banner which rips in half and gently stops him from hitting the ground. Minutes later, Norman Osborn gets into his limo to leave. As Harry walks up to him, he asks, Are you okay, Dad? And Norman says, I'm fine. And then Norman just leaves, not showing any bit of concern for the well-being of his son. A short while later, Norman arrives at Oscorp where he meets up with the Hobgoblin. Osborne then tells Hobgoblin that you failed, Hobgoblin. I hired you to assassinate Wilson Fisk and you couldn't even do that. Hobgoblin then replies, he only failed to kill Fisk because Norman Osborn neglected to tell him that Spider-Man would be there. Norman then fires Hobgoblin and orders him to leave the glider at Oscorp. The Hobgoblin aims his gun at Norman. Norman threatens to Hobgoblin by saying, I'm the only one who knows your secret identity and I'll reveal it to the world if anything ever happens to me. Hobgoblin replies that, hold on a minute Norman, you owe me, and for that I'm keeping the glider as my payment. And as Hobgoblin uses the glider to fly out of Oscorp, Norman angrily shakes his fist in the air. Hmm, interesting stuff here. So, the question you have to ask is, why would Norman Osborn want to take out the Kingpin? We'll find out very soon, no doubt about that. Sometime later at the Parker house, Peter and Aunt May watch a news report about Peter saving Wilson Fisk's life. May then tells Peter that if he's going to move out, he must stop risking his life so that she'll feel okay. Peter then remarks that he won't move out unless she doesn't want him to. However, May tells Peter that living on your own is something that young people have to do. And Mary Jane is moving out and Anna Watson will be moving in with me. Peter then thanks his aunt May and tells her that even though he's moving out, he will always be there for her. May then goes into the kitchen and sheds a tear for Peter because of how much he risks his life and almost got himself killed by the hobgoblin. So the next day we see Peter arrive at the apartment with his things and as Peter goes to knock on the door, Flash Thompson opens it and tells him that the only reason he's room with Harry instead of him is because of his dumb luck. However, Harry shows up and politely asks Flash to leave Peter alone. As Peter walks in, he sees that Harry is throwing a housewarming party. 
Peter then asks Harry, when can you thank his dad? Harry replies and says that, oh, you know what my dad's like? He's so busy with Oscorp. As Harry walks off to talk to the party guest, Mary Jane shows up. Mary Jane then tells Peter that he could be busted by the fashion police unless she helps them decorate. As Peter walks into his bedroom, he sees that the apartment has huge windows. Peter then says to himself that the huge windows will be perfect for web swinging out of the apartment and that moving out of Aunt May's place could be the best thing he has ever done. Oh, Peter, if only you really knew how Aunt May felt. Poor lady. To that night, the Hobgoblin breaks into Crime Central looking for any secrets Fisk is hiding. Hobgoblin then discovers an elevator hidden behind a portrait of Fisk, and as he enters it, a giant metal claw grabs Hobgoblin by the waist and the elevator begins to move down. When the elevator stops on the bottom floor, the Hobgoblin walks out and is surrounded by several men with guns. Kingpin then threatens to have his men kill Hobgoblin. The Hobgoblin begins to laugh and says that he thought Crime Central was just a myth. Hobgoblin then tells the Kingpin to have his men lower their weapons and even says that he will tell him who it was that hired him to kill him. Kingpin then has his men lower their weapons and then the Kingpin asks Hobgoblin, what is it you want? And Hobgoblin says, I want money and a chance to show how valuable I can be to the kingpin and also I want control of Crime Central. Hobgoblin tells Kingpin that it was Norman Osborne that hired me to assassinate you. As Kingpin slams his fist onto his desk, Kingpin hits his phone and crushes it. Kingpin then has Alistair Smythe give Hobgoblin new upgraded weapons. Smythe asks why does he wear the Hobgoblin costume? Hobgoblin replies that he wears it to strike fear into his enemies. The next morning, Peter wakes up and sees that the apartment is a mess from the party last night. As the phone rings, Peter answers it and frantically starts cleaning up the apartment. When Harry sees Peter, he asks, what are you doing? And Peter replies that my Aunt May is on her way and she will freak out at the sight of this dirty place. Just then, his spider sense goes off and the doorbell rings. Too late. She's actually here. Peter thinks that it's strange that Aunt May would trigger his spider sense, but shrugs it off that Aunt May must be really a mad and then lets her in. May is shocked by the sight of the dirty apartment. Just then, the hobgoblin flies into the apartment and throws a pumpkin bomb into the room and releases a smoke screen and grabs Harry and flies off. As the smoke clears, Peter sees May lying unconscious on the floor and calls 911. He is then taken to the hospital where the doctor examines her and tells Peter that she had a seizure and that is why she is unconscious. All we can do is just give her time. As the doctor leaves the room, Peter thinks to himself that this is all his fault and feels responsible for what just happened to Aunt May and of course what happened to his Uncle Ben. Now, this is very interesting because they did a scene very similar to this many years later in the first Spider-Man movie. And that was where the Green Goblin kind of just frightened May Parker into a state of shock. So the Hobgoblin in this scene, throwing pumpkin bombs and Aunt May is unconscious, you know. By this point, no villain that I can remember in the animated series has ever gone after Aunt May and for Hobgoblin to do that was very uh, interesting and that kind of puts Hobgoblin on a different level of villains compared to the others and once again all fingers point back to Norman Osborn so in a way you can kind of look at it like Norman Osborn is kind of the main villain of this episode even though the kingpin as we all know is in control and running everything from behind the scenes i would say for this episode at least anyway norman osborne is the one working from behind the scenes and pulling the strings and even has hobgoblin hired to try and take out the kingpin so good stuff here so it's kind of interesting in the dynamic how everyone's flips over role reversals here so very well done in this episode in my opinion Sometime later, Hobgoblin arrives at Crime Central with Harry Osborne. Smythe then tells Kingpin that Hobgoblin cannot be trusted. However, Kingpin replies by saying that Hobgoblin reminds me of myself as a young man, and he might make the Hobgoblin his protege. Hobgoblin then places Harry in a tiny glass cell. As Harry asks why was he kidnapped, 
Hobgoblin asks her, because your father is very rich. As Hobgoblin tells Kingpin to pay him for the job, Kingpin replies that he will get paid whenever he wants to pay him. Moments later, Kingpin calls Norman at Oscorp and tells him that he has his son. Kingpin also reveals that Hobgoblin now works for him and that he wants his inventions in exchange for his son. Norman is hesitant because he knows that his inventions are his life's work and that it will ruin him if he gives them away. Kingpin then tells Norman that he can either have his inventions or his son and that he has 24 hours to sign the inventions over to him or else his son will die. Norman Osborn might be uh, a master manipulator but Kingpin is, you know, the godfather of manipulation so Norman Osborn is stupid to take on Wilson Fisk in my opinion. Meanwhile, at the hospital, Mary Jane goes to visit May in her hospital room and sees Peter, who asks if the police have any leads on where Harry is. However, Mary Jane replies that the police have no leads. Peter then reveals to Mary Jane that he believed that the Hobgoblin was after him. However, Peter realises that Hobgoblin could not have known that he was living in the apartments. Peter also remembers that Hobgoblin said that he was going to kill two birds with one stone. This gives Peter an idea and he tells Mary Jane to stay with Aunt May as he runs out of the hospital room. Later on, Hobgoblin returns to Oscorp and tells Norman that he cannot trust the Kingpin. However, Norman grabs a nearby laser gun and aims it at Hobgoblin. Hobgoblin then tells Norman that he also wants Kingpin dead and they should work together. Norman, of course, agrees to this. However, unknown to both of them, Smythe is spying on both of them by having a spider seeker transmit a live video feed to Crime Central. At that moment, Peter arrives at Oscorp to see Norman. However, the security guards do not let him through the front gate. Back inside, Hobgoblin tells Norman that if he is to go after Fisk, he will need better weaponry. Norman replies that he's already given him everything he has. However, Hobgoblin replies that you geniuses always make one thing but have something better on the drawing board. Norman then gives Hobgoblin a bigger and better glider that can go higher and faster than his original. Peter is then able to sneak into Oscorp and confronts the Hobgoblin as Spider-Man. As Hobgoblin flies off on his new glider, Spider-Man shoots a web line at it and is carried into the sky along with the glider. Hobgoblin then flies into the city and is able to cut Spider-Man's web on a flagpole and release missiles from his glider that are able to lock onto Spider-Man and follow him. Hobgoblin then detaches his original glider from the new glider and is able to control the new glider from remote control to attack Spider-Man. As the new glider hits Spider-Man, it carries him above the city and Hobgoblin reattaches the other glider onto it. Hobgoblin then flies back into the city and Spider-Man is able to get free from the front of the glider and dive into an open window on the building. Just then, Hobgoblin fires missiles from his glider which go into the same window that Spider-Man jumped into and the whole building blows up. Hobgoblin, believing that Spider-Man is dead, laughs at his fallen enemy as part one is brought to a close. Overall, part one of the Hobgoblin episode, very good. I like how the Hobgoblin is mostly shrouded in mystery. We don't know a lot about him other than the fact that he was hired by Norman Osborn to take out the Kingpin. And of course, the Kingpin turns the tables and has Harry Osborn kidnapped and makes a exchange that you can have your son back in exchange for your inventions so lots of manipulation going on in this episode norman osborne kingpin and the hobgoblin all trying to one-up each other aunt may sadly was a casualty due to being gassed by the hobgoblin so there was lots of stuff going on in this episode and i would probably say that out of norman osborne the kingpin and the hobgoblin I will probably say Norman Osborn is the main villain of this episode because he's the one that's pulling all the strings from behind the scenes. So he's hired the Hobgoblin to take out the Kingpin. And of course, the Hobgoblin turns on Norman Osborn and sides with the Kingpin. But at the end of the day, Norman Osborn is the one behind all of it. And of course, Hobgoblin, he's going to stab both of these guys in the back because that's who he is. So overall, I really enjoyed this episode a lot and I thought this was a great part one of the Hobgoblin two-parter. So now that we have concluded the Hobgoblin part one, we are now going to move on to the Hobgoblin part two. 
So, as we saw in The Hobgoblin Part 1, we learned that he was hired by Norman Osborn to assassinate the Kingpin. This led to the Hobgoblin breaking into Crime Central and revealing to the Kingpin that Norman Osborn was the one who hired him to take him out. The Hobgoblin then decides to switch sides and work with the Kingpin instead, after revealing that he just wants money. This led to Harry Osborne, the son of Norman Osborne, being kidnapped, with the Kingpin threatening Norman Osborne that either turn over your inventions or your son dies. And the Hobgoblin then reveals to Norman Osborne that he plans on betraying the Kingpin and that the two of them should work together to take him down. Norman Osborne, of course, agrees and gives him an upgraded glider and extra weapons. This led, of course, to a confrontation with Spider-Man, as Spider-Man hung from his glider and ends up falling into the window of an abandoned warehouse. We then see the Hobgoblin throw a series of pumpkin bombs into the building and it blows up. And we see at the very end of part one, the Hobgoblin ends up laughing, thinking that he has actually killed Spider-Man. And to me, I thought that was an excellent way to end part one of the Hobgoblin episode, which I thought was absolutely brilliant and much better than I expected. So now that we have concluded part one, we now move on to the Hobgoblin part two and this episode pretty much picks up where we left off at the end of part one as we see spider-man jump through an open window on a building and just then missiles from hobgoblin's glider begin to follow him however spider-man manages to get through a window on the other side before the bombs can explode when spider-man gets to the street he looks around and sees that there are no tall buildings for him to get into the air to attack the hobgoblin just then the hobgoblin flies above spider-man and shoots flames from his glider as spider-man does a backflip to avoid the fire he jumps into a nearby garbage truck spider-man then crawls into a dumpster be being held by the garbage truck and it is then set back on the ground However, Hobgoblin spots Spider-Man and drops a pumpkin bomb into it, but Spider-Man is able to get free before the bombs explode. As Spider-Man runs away, Hobgoblin continues to fire missiles at him, and Spider-Man then crawls under a nearby van, and Hobgoblin fires more missiles at it, and it explodes. Believing that Spider-Man is actually dead, Hobgoblin flies away on his glider. However, Spider-Man managed to survive by crawling into the sewer. A short while later at Oscorp, Norman Osborn watches a news report about Harry's kidnapping. As Norman turns off the television, he turns round and sees Spider-Man who grabs him by his shirt and demands to know why the Hobgoblin was at Oscorp earlier. Norman replies that he can't say anything and Spider-Man realises that Norman has made a deal with the Hobgoblin to get his son back. Norman continues by saying that he will get his son back at midnight. As Spider-Man leaves, he tells Norman Osborn that he will be back at 12.01am just to make sure that the Hobgoblin kept his word. Now this is... An interesting bit of foreshadowing here because Spider-Man and Norman Osborn are having a confrontation of sorts but this wouldn't be the last time as we all know because we know that Norman Osborn will become the Green Goblin later on in the show so it's kind of cool that we're getting a little taste of what's to come in the near future and the fact that Spider-Man is in Oscorp with Norman Osborn of all people really helps quietly plant the seeds for Norman Osborn to become quite possibly Spider-Man's biggest ever villain that he's ever faced. After his chat with Norman Osborn, Peter Parker changes back into his street clothes and goes to see Aunt May at the hospital. Now the reason why Aunt May is at the hospital is because in The Hobgoblin Part 1 Aunt May suffered a seizure attack just shortly after the Hobgoblin broke into Peter Parker's apartment and gassed the entire building. So you can imagine that the Hobgoblin is now officially on Peter Parker's most wanted list and wants revenge on him in a big way. So as we see Peter walks into May's room, he sees Mary Jane and asks her how Aunt May is doing. Mary Jane answers that there is no change in her condition. And Peter thanks Mary Jane for staying with her. As Peter looks at May, he thinks to himself that I hope someday you can forgive me. And he blames himself for what's happened to her. 
Later that night at Crime Central, Hobgoblin walks into Kingpin's office looking for him. Thinking that Kingpin is not in the building, he sits at his desk on his massive leather chair. However, Kingpin arrives by taking the elevator. Upon seeing the Hobgoblin at his desk, Kingpin states that he has noticed that Hobgoblin craves power. Hobgoblin then asks about when will he get paid. However, Kingpin turns on a monitor on his desk and shows a recording of the Hobgoblin telling Norman that they can work together by killing the Kingpin. Hobgoblin defends himself by saying that he was just lying to Osborne so he could get what he wanted. Kingpin then fires at Hobgoblin and tells him that I don't take kindly to traitors and I always eliminate those who try to betray me. He then calls in his guards to kill him and says I never ever want to see this man again. Hobgoblin then releases several pumpkin bombs into the room and is able to fly on his glider into another part of the room where he's confronted by more guards. However, Hobgoblin is able to call in his big glider and uses it to drive the guards away. As Alistair Smythe starts to get away, Kingpin grabs his hubba chair and says that they must stay and fight that madman. However, Kingpin realises that they are no match for Hobgoblin and both flee Crime Central. Hobgoblin then declares that now I am the new Kingpin of Crime and all of this is mine. Hobgoblin then releases Harry from his cell and tells him that by keeping him, I will finally get revenge on his father. Later on, Norman receives a video call from Hobgoblin who tells him that now he has control of the Kingpin's organisation and that he also wants Norman to hand over his inventions. As Norman threatens to reveal the Hobgoblin's identity to the world, Hobgoblin reveals that, you know what, I've decided that I'm going to keep Harry as a hostage. Just as Hobgoblin ends the video transmission, Kingpin and Smythe arrive. Kingpin tells Norman that they will need to work together to defeat the Hobgoblin once and for all, and that they need to get back inside Crime Central by going through a secret tunnel that they use to escape. Kingpin then says that they also need a new weapon that can take down the Hobgoblin's new glider. Norman replies that he knows someone that can help them. So then at 12.01am, Spider-Man returns to Oscorp just as promised and sees that Harry and Hobgoblin are nowhere to be seen. Norman says that Hobgoblin double-crossed him and that he needs Spider-Man's help. Spider-Man asks, why should I trust you? And Norman answers that because he knows they both want to capture him. Norman then takes Spider-Man to the secret tunnel Kingpin told him about and Spider-Man uses it to enter Crime Central. Norman then reports to the Kingpin that Spider-Man is on his way into Crime Central. As Spider-Man arrives at the floor of Crime Central, he is able to sneak into Hobgoblin's office and web his glider to the floor. As the glider falls to the ground, it makes a loud sound, alerting Hobgoblin to his presence. Hobgoblin then throws a pumpkin bomb onto the floor, which releases a smoke screen. Using the smoke as a cover, Hobgoblin runs over to his glider, but is ambushed by Spider-Man. Hobgoblin then grabs a razor-sharp disc from his bag and throws it at Spider-Man, but misses him. As Hobgoblin uses the razor disc to cut the webbing from his glider, he gets on the glider and flies after Spider-Man. Hobgoblin then drops another bomb, but it destroys several pieces of equipment in the room. Realising he is beat, Hobgoblin throws his last razor disc at the rope, suspending Harry above their heads, which cuts it, causing Harry to fall. As Spider-Man saves Harry, Hobgoblin uses this opportunity to escape. Spider-Man then takes Harry into the elevator and goes down. At that moment, Kingpin and Smythe enter Crime Central from their helicopter and see on the monitors that Harry and Spider-Man are in the elevator. Kingpin tells Smythe that Spider-Man must not be allowed to escape and Smythe detaches the cable from the elevator, causing it to rapidly fall. However, Spider-Man is able to climb out of the hatch at the top with Harry and shoot a web line, which gets it then off the elevator before it crashes. As Spider-Man makes it to the tunnel, Smythe sets off an explosion. However, Spider-Man is able to make it outside before he and Harry get caught in the blast. Back inside Crime Central, Kingpin promises to rebuild his headquarters bigger and better than ever before. Back at the hospital, the doctor examines May and tells Mary Jane that there is still no improvement, and Mary Jane wonders where Peter is. At that moment, Spider-Man returns to Oscorp with Harry. Spider-Man tells Norman Osborn that he has questions for him, but Norman Osborn refuses to answer them.
Spider-Man then accuses Norman of playing games with the Hobgoblin and his son's life. This makes Norman angry and tells Spider-Man that he cares about his son and he has made some wrong choices in the past and that maybe he hasn't always been there for his son but I do care for him. At that moment Harry wakes up and Spider-Man's spider sense goes off. The Hobgoblin then flies overhead on his glider and throws a pumpkin bomb into the room and as it explodes the explosion causes a steam beam to fall. Norman then jumps on top of Harry to shield him. However, Spider-Man is able to catch the beam before it can crush both of them. Spider-Man then goes outside and climbs to the top of a smokestack. As the Hobgoblin attempts to ram him, Spider-Man jumps down and the glider hits the smokestack which causes Hobgoblin to lose control of his glider and flies into the river. A short while later, Peter goes to the hospital to see Aunt May. As he walks into her room, he asks the doctor, how is she doing? And the doctor answers, still the same. The doctor asks, where have you been? And he answers that he had something to do. And the doctor says, what, well, more important than being here? Before the doctor walks out, he says to Peter that you should have been here with your aunt. And that's the problem with you young people today. You can't seem to make the right choices. Peter then thanks Mary Jane for staying with his aunt May because he knows how busy she is moving out of her aunt's place. Mary Jane replies that she actually decided not to move out because of what happened to May because she became worried about leaving her own aunt by herself. Just then May wakes up of her coma and May reveals to Peter that the shock of seeing his dirty apartment is what caused her to go into a coma and not because of the hobgoblin. May also tells Peter that she doesn't think he is ready to live on his own and Peter agrees with her. Finally May tells Peter that when he saved Wilson Fisk's life he was doing the right thing and that Uncle Ben would have been very proud of him. A very touching scene and also a very interesting way to start the build up to Peter Parker actually learning the truth about Wilson Fisk and his Kingpin's secret identity because as I mentioned already the Kingpin has been well aware of Spider-Man's existence for quite some time but Spider-Man doesn't know about his existence just yet so I thought that was an interesting way to kick off their build up. We then see at the end Hobgoblin flies away on his glider swearing that Spider-Man better not forget about him because I won't forget about you. And that concludes the Hobgoblin part two of the two-parter and my review. Overall excellent follow-up to the Hobgoblin part one. I enjoyed both parts one and two very much but I would probably say that part one had the slight edge but there wasn't a lot in it and as I mentioned I enjoyed both parts one and two very much and I thought the way they ended part two with the Hobgoblin just flying off into the night I thought that was a cool way to keep the door open for the Hobgoblin to return and he does return in the next season and in several story arcs to come and we do learn eventually his real name and his secret identity but that's going to be for another review for a future edition for another time but I quite enjoyed both parts and Norman Osborn playing roulette with his son's life just shows you the kind of man Norman Osborn really is and as I mentioned already he may not be fully evil like the hobgoblin or the kingpin he just does questionable things and makes very bizarre choices but at the same time i think norman osborne was really the main villain of this entire two-part episode because he was the one that brought in the hobgoblin to begin with to try and screw the kingpin over which was not a wise thing to do but you know this was very good i enjoyed both parts but i would say part one was just a little bit better so that's going to be it from me i am going to wrap this up now what did you think of the hobgoblin part two did you enjoy it do you think it was better than part one or do you think part one was better than part two what do you think of peter parker saving wilson fisk's life do you think this was a good way to kick off the build up where Peter Parker eventually learns about Wilson Fisk's true kingpin identity and of his existence and also what about Norman Osborn do you think Spider-Man was right do you think he does gamble with his son's life every now and then and also do you think Norman Osborn was really the main villain of this episode you know what to do guys 
hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, leave your thoughts and comments down below, and I will see all of you next time for another edition of the Spider-Man review series, where I am going to be talking about another favourite episode of mine from Season 1. So until next time, take care everybody, and stay safe, and once again, thanks for listening.